Well, look, it depends on the segment you talk, uh, you're talking about. I think there will be a lot of pressure on EV, a reduction of, uh, you know, pricing uh, uh, that we already see since uh, a few months. But I think that in the case of Renault, I mean, we've been relatively prudent in our guidance, uh, but we are also on the other side optimistic because we'll be launching, you know, 10 models, basically one model every month. So we enter into the very favorable product life, life cycle, including EV cars, because uh, we're bringing a small EV platform with Renault 5 in the market. That will be the first one of a European uh, OEM. So let's try you know, to fight and keep uh, in that kind of positive dynamic also for 2024. Yeah, Luca, but, you know, the um, market is challenging, obviously. I know, yeah, it, it is challenging. And, and you've taken a swing at the, uh, the shareholders as well, or the investors talking about the, the pretty childish swing, the pendulum swing in their, their approach to EV. But, but are they being childish about valuations of the, and prospects for the sector, or are they actually just being really concerned about the profitability of EV growth? Now, look, I think that the OEM are working very hard to reduce the cost of EVs, and one day in a few years we'll get to price parity between the, you know, uh, both technology. That will be for sure one of the factors that will reassure everybody. It's actually already happened in China. In a way, you see, you know, you, you see electrified or electric vehicles are like 40% of the market, so, so it shouldn't be different, uh, you know, in Europe if we get there. And I think cars like the Renault 5 that are kind of very affordable cars will help in this direction. I, I, what I'm saying is that we shouldn't doubt. We cannot stop progress of technology, okay? So, and, uh, and the electric cars will be, uh, you know, dominant technology in Europe. And I'm not sure it will be when and if they will be, uh, you know, 100% immediately, et cetera. But uh, I think we have to fight for it, for, for the industry and, uh, and for the customer, for the environment. So that's what I'm only trying to say. It's, and it's a road, you know, full of bumps up and downs, but the long-term trend is that electric cars will be a dominant technology in Europe, also because of the, of the CAFE regulation. So without electric car, you cannot meet uh, the targets. This is uh, as simple as that. Uh, Luca, hi, this is Charlotte jumping in here. Can you um, tell us how you see demand in 24? Of course, we heard from competitor Celantis uh, this morning reporting as well, saying they see a complicated outlook for car makers. So can you flesh this out for us? How do you see demand in 24? I mean, in our geographical perimeter, we are not betting on a, on a big growth of, uh, you know, the, the European market. I think that we will be a little bit anti-cyclical because of uh, huge uh, offer, you know, new offer of products. But even in our, you know, plan and our budget, we're not looking at, uh, you know, growing enormously in terms of volume. What the focus for us is actually protecting our margin, you know, keeping the cost uh, down, et cetera, et cetera, because, uh, you know, we know that there will be a lot of volatility, uh, hopefully by second semester of uh, uh, of, uh, of this year, things like election will be true, and then uh, maybe interest rate will be, you know, go going down, which is important for us for monthly rate for, for our customers. So I think we shouldn't be over pessimistic, but also not over optimistic. So the European market uh, will probably not go uh, back uh, at the level we saw before the COVID, uh, I would say even structurally, if you want my opinion. And can I ask you about Ampere, of course, now that you described the IPO, you said when you made the announcement that uh, Nissan Mitsubishi would still invest in Ampere. At the time of the IPO, they said we invest 600 and 200 million, respectively. Um, how you, have these investments confirmed? Can, can you clarify for us at what level are they going to invest in Ampere? I mean, I think that technically uh, that investment is part of the contract with or without an IPO. So we have a contract with them and everybody will have to respect. It doesn't mean that we, we are not, uh, let's say, open and, and ready to discuss with them in which kind of form this investment will come now that we don't do the IPO of Ampere. But I can confirm you that this is part of the, of the deal we made with uh, our colleagues and friends from Nissan and uh, Mitsubishi. Different cases for Qualcomm because uh, in the case of Qualcomm, it, it was linked to the IPO. But it doesn't mean that we, you know, stop the partnership with, uh, you know, with Qualcomm. On the contrary, I think we're going to reinforce it because we need them to you know, bring a centralized electronic architecture and SDV uh, in Europe on our cars. 
Look at Arabila then uh, in London, then if EV demand were to pick up uh, uh, across Europe, would that make you reconsider your listing of Ampere? Look, uh, for the time being, we have never thought about what, what you are trying to do is to focus on executing the plan as, as exactly as we presented that in November in the capital market day. That means, uh, you know, bringing six or seven models in the range, uh, reducing the cost and, you know, gradually now from now to 2027, 20, 40 percent you know, getting a car produced in less than 10 hours in the way. All these things are happening, and I think that, you know, the preparation of uh, an IPO is also time-consuming for the team, so it's giving us actually a little bit more time to focus on the job and, uh, and is, is working. For give you an example, we have uh, last, last week we have kind of a certified that a new product development process for Renault that, is, that should now don't, uh, will not last more than two years, which is will be a record and close to what the Chinese OEM are doing. And now this thing is written in the stone. Uh, so because speed will be very important. And that's typically what Ampere is supposed to do in, in this house, to, to be a kind of a avant-garde on how to handle specifically EV and software technology. Yeah, um, just wanted to get perhaps a little bit more detail, if you will, just with regards to Saudi Aramco's investment then uh, in your tie-up with, uh, with Geely. Is there, is there any more with regards to that that you could share? But look, uh, we are, you know, so far the process, this kind of process is pretty long. You need to go to a lot of antitrust, uh, you know, discussion ever around the world, etc. So it has been somehow slowed down by, you know, the anti, antitrust process that we have to go through. And, uh, you know, uh, in, let's say, a, a foreign investment, uh, you know, criteria that we have to match, particularly in France. So we feel that uh, in the next uh, few weeks we'll be able to, Officialize that we move to the next step. Of course, we signed already the, you know, the deal with uh, with Gili, and as soon as this thing is official, then we can engage with our friends from Aram Aramco. So the project stays valid. It's a very, it's a very interesting, uh, you know, deal uh, for all of us, and uh, you know, it's going to bring a big benefit to all the companies. I'm convinced. So just be patient a few weeks more and. Uh, I will try. I can then be more specific about what this whole thing means. Luca, we're all being patient as well about this EU anti-subsidy investigation uh, into Chinese EVs. You don't have a huge presence in China with sales. Nissan has a, a much larger presence, of course. In terms of what we think uh, Mr. Dombrovskis and the other commissioners are going to turn up here, I presume there's a contribution to this anti-subsidy investigation from Renault. I just wonder what your input into this is and what you think the result should be. But look, there's nothing I can say about that because this is like a process that is handled by the European Commission. They have the all rights of doing this kind of investigation. It doesn't mean that then they conclude one thing or another. It's up to them to decide and to see if, uh, you know, a kind of level playing field uh, had uh, taken you know, place uh, in the automotive industry. So there's nothing I can comment. So, of course, if we are requested to provide you know, data, etc., of course, we will have to be open to the uh, authorities. And, uh, and there are things like this in any sector. Uh, you know, so, of course, when it touches the automotive business, it becomes always a little bit more spectacular. But this kind of thing is normal practice from the European community. OK, let me ask you your own opinion then, not what the Commission is going to find out. Do you believe that there is uh, a dumping regime in Chinese exports of EVs to Europe? Well, look, I, 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 I tell you the thing the other way around. I think that uh, Europe requires, uh, you know, a much more solid industrial strategy. Uh, to be able to ramp up, uh, you know, some technologies, not only the auto auto automotive sector, but for sure on the EV side, we, I think we need, uh, you know, a much more structured and long-term approach to what we've seen so far, because this will be a team sport. It's a team sport between OEMs, infrastructure industry, energy industry, and, of course, uh, uh, authorities. So I think that that's the most urgent thing. And because uh, we are right now experiencing some form of, uh, you know, in general, if you want, uh, asymmetry, competitive asymmetry between China that has executed a plan that is actually working on the EV side, 
controlling, you know, especially the upstream part of the value chain, and U.S. that somehow with the IRA has favored, you know, local production, somehow closing the market there. And Europe is in the middle, and we need to come up with, uh, with the plan. Maybe it will be a mix of uh, both approaches, but we need that, and we have been also at the, you know, at the ASEA very vocal about that need to discuss with the authority, not to only, you know, receive uh, new regulation from Brussels, but also sit, sit together and find, try to find a plan, because uh, we are potentially suffering from uh, competition that is very, very strong from East and from West. Uh, Luca, can I ask you about subsidies? We see the French government uh, hold a couple of subsidy programs that they had uh, because they didn't budget enough. It was so successful. They had to stop them. So I want to get your take on this kind of subsidy programs. Are they useful? Are they insufficient? Because I've heard from other players in the field said, look, we don't need subsidies for EVs anymore. What we need is that money being invested in infrastructure. So can I just have your take on this whole uh, subsidies around EVs? Uh, look, I think that the, at, at that level of mix, uh, probably the EV demand uh, is still not natural. Okay? So I think subsidies are a way to ramp up the thing. So we are in favor of that. I think we need to have, uh, you know, of course, a very intelligent application of, uh, of them, but we also believe that we need some kind of a long-term uh, perspective. It cannot be, you know, uh, we, you go in and then you go out, or one country does it, one, and the other country doesn't do it. I mean, we look at the, the effect that the, you know, the cancellation of subsidies in Germany had on the EV market. This is kind of perturbating, you know, our activity. So, I am in favor of that, and I. But I also realize that uh, you can, uh, you have to put money into, you know, enabling condition for people to really use EVs. Uh, it's not necessarily only the, you know, the government and, the, you know, you don't have to necessarily, let's say, pay that with the, with the taxes of uh, the contributor. But I think that, uh, you know, we need to find a way for infrastructure industry and energy industry to find a business model and that business case on that, and then it will work. So, so, but it will require a huge amount of money. We're talking about a hundred billions of euros to make sure that, uh, people can use an EV like they use uh, uh, you know, a nice car in, in, uh, in Europe. So it's a major industrial project.